Right, so it's actually very difficult to present on Zoom. I've been doing loads over the last few weeks because you get no feedback. Um, and if I'm projecting slides, I can't see comments. So my plan is to talk for about 30 minutes and then open up for questions. Yeah? Um, or such is the plan, right? So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Um, so the concept here is rewilding agile. That's a key concept from ecology at the moment about restoring wild places. And the metaphor I want to use on this, I want to start with dogs and end with cats. And I'll, you know, I'll make a controversial statement at the end. Um, if you actually look in the wild, this is a timber wolf. Uh, canines in the wild have no more than three or four species. Um, they all look very similar. They're actually really resilient. They're often the apex predator within their environment. Timber wolf in Yellowstone and so on. I'm um, highly adaptive. The trouble is if you domesticate them, um, you end up with this. Um, lots and lots of variety. Within about seven generations, you get massive variety. But all of the different species, yeah, they're all still canines, but they lack resilience. And part of my overall argument here is that that's what's happened with Agile. It's gone from being a set of principles and values produced at the, in Snowbird, which were designed to say we've been going in the wrong direction, we need to change things you know, with XP, then Scrum, and then a whole variety of methods. And now it's effectively become this mass of highly individualized, highly commercial, highly commoditized offerings, each of which is trying to compete with the other or saying they're the better breed. And that to me is a real problem. So I want to look at some of those issues. And it's kind of an argument here. I rather like this picture, the idea that Agile is actually a sheep in wool's clothing um, rather than the other way around. So several things which are problematic. Yeah? Firstly, if an idea is going to take off, it needs structure. One of the reasons that Agile grew is because of Scrum. Um, because Scrum has a high level of structure. Um, it gives people a degree of certainty. And to some extent, we lost the sort of XP type roots and even some of the DSDM type roots within Agile because that was less easy to understand. It was more skill-based, it wasn't structured. So the irony is you need structure for adoption, for mass adoption, but the very structure itself can actually reduce the variety within the system. And for quite a long period of time, Agile meant Scrum for some people. Then you get the Scrum Kanban Wars, and then you get the appalling travesty, which is safe, which is nothing but anything anybody wants to get trained in will give you a certificate on. And that, to me, uh, the growth of things like SAFE and the shift of the Scrum Alliance to compete with SAFE was an indication that Agile was coming to the end of its lifespan, and we need to start to think a degree of reinvention. So structure is necessary for scale, but the trouble is it, it's often the wrong sort of structure. And we'll come back to that when I talk, uh, talk about scaffolding at the end. Second is the whole certification scam. This has got to quite ridiculous levels. So you see people um, with agile CVs with about 15 sets of initials after their name, most of which actually represent just turning up for a two or three day course or doing an open book exam four to five weeks later after a course. And I've got three sets of initials I can put after my name, but they all came out of two to three years of academic work and external examination. So it's kind of like anything these days can be certified. The latest nonsense to come out is apparently you can now become a lean scrum master, which probably means you've lost weight, which a lot of scrum masters should do anyway. So it's become this generation and also it's lots and lots of small commercial companies making their money entirely out of that. And that's a major problem for Agile in terms of credibility. Third thing, and this is kind of like a metaphor. Um, there are too many recipe book users and very few chefs. So this is an important concept. A recipe book user um, can follow a recipe provided they've got all the right ingredients and all the right equipments. But if something changes, they're lost. Whereas the chef has two types of knowledge, theoretical knowledge of taste and practical knowledge acquired through apprenticeship. And so they can make a wonderful meal with whatever you happen to have lying around. 
And the only reason why some of these very large frameworks like SAFE survive is there's a few chefs in there who make things work despite the method, yet not because of the method. So Agile, to my mind, is over-focused on recipe book creation and certification and under-focused on chefs um, in terms of the way it works. Uh, fourth is what we can call the Spotify error, which is seeing something you like and trying to imitate it. Now, Spotify keeps saying there isn't a Spotify system because all we've got is something which evolved, and it evolved in Sweden, which is a pretty unique culture anyway. So you can't take the end point of an evolutionary process and just simply replicate it. Or do what McKinsey's have done is just tag some traditional management consultancy platitudes onto it and claim it's the same thing. Um, the key principle, I'm going to argue this several times, is you have to start, you need to start journeys with a sense of direction but not goals. And each journey to agree will be unique. So you can't copy the end point of somebody's journey but you can learn from how they started and use that as your own starting point. Uh, fifthly, this is the massive issue within social science anyway. My background is physics and philosophy. And from a physics point of view, no social scientist has ever had enough data to form any valid conclusion. But then you add the correlation causation. So if you look at the way methods are developed, Somebody goes and studies four or five companies, or maybe 10 companies if you're lucky, who they consider to be successful. They identify things that those companies have done, and then they say, if you do these things, you too will be successful. As I say, in real science, that's called the confusion of correlation with causation. So for example, yeah, if the UK wants to increase the number of Nobel Prizes, yeah, it's theoretically my country, though I'm more Welsh than I am British these days. Um, but let's make it Wales. If Wales, with a population of 3 million people, wants to increase the number of Nobel Prizes per head of population, all we need to do is increase dark chocolate consumption. Because dark chocolate consumption and Nobel Prizes actually correlate over about 30 years. And that's a much bigger data set um, than you see in most social and management science. So the fact that you can see characteristics of what's happened in the past doesn't mean you can, from that, link into a correlation. The fact that the 100 successful Fortune 500 companies have chief executives who play golf doesn't mean that if you invest in golf training for your CEO, it's the equivalent of leadership training. And then we get the ideology-based approaches. So these are theories seeking facts to actually confirm them. What we call, instead of evidence-based policy, it's policy-determined evidence. So one of the worst examples of this within the Agile community um, is reinventing the organization by the Crocs, where he has a highly you know, quasi-religious theory about how life should be. And the only example, he doesn't even choose examples that match that. He actually picks parts of those examples and doesn't report any of the data which challenge the thesis. But you know, producing a book which says what people want to believe and changing history to conform with it has a long, long um, pedigree within human systems. But it amazes me that people who are meant to be based around logic and structure in Agile get taken in by these sort of books, but it's, it's very frequent. So those are all current known problems. And the approach we adopt, and I developed this originally in IBM something like 25 years ago, was to say, we never get enough data to form valid conclusions in management science. And also nobody can repeat experiments. In fact, all the classic experiments in psychology that people are now repeating don't produce the same results when they're tried again. But we do know things about the way people make decisions, about the way systems operate, around the evolution of human ability to, of inventiveness, that's think with this ethics. So there's a whole bunch of stuff we know from natural science, which has been independently validated and peer reviewed. And therefore we can use that as a constraint. And this is rather like the way physics works, is you develop a theory, then you seek experimental validation. So the work I've done over the years, and it's lately been applied to Agile, but it comes from many other fields, is to say, what do we know from natural science and from that construct methods and tools and then perform experimental validation to see which work and which don't work and continue that iteration. And that's actually 
the origin of Kinevin yeah, as a framework. So I'm going to run through three of those sciences quickly just to make the point. Um, this is something I quote frequently at Agile conferences. So you take a group of radiologists who have a fairly disciplined training, who are dealing with a fairly limited data set. You give them a batch of x-rays um, and ask them to look for cancer nodules. And on the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla in plain sight which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. And in actual fact, 83% do not see it, even though their eyes scanned it. And the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the 83%. And this type of experiment has been repeated in many contexts. And it's something called inattentional blindness. We do not see what we do not expect to see. And this explains a lot of the issues, for example, in testing software. It explains a large amount of the problems about getting user definitions, etc. that we only see what we expect to see, the patterns of our past experience, largely determine what we see in the future. Now, this is not something we can train people not to do. In fact, you know, Klein has argued, and I agree with him, that there's no such thing as a cognitive bias. There are only cognitive heuristics. Evolution doesn't throw out things which don't have utility. Uh, basically, inattentional blindness is all about making decisions very quickly under conditions of uncertainty, where we can't afford to scan everything and we have to use our most recent experiences as the primary filter. So in evolutionary terms, you can see where this happened. So we're not going to change it, but we can create methods and tools which actually work with it, not against it. So one of the things I will need to do, and I'll use this phrase later, is find the 17% before they talk to the 83%. So that's one key aspect, and that's fundamental to software design and delivery. The second thing is, how do we actually learn? So if anybody's got children, you tell them bedtime stories, but you don't tell them stories of goodness, you tell them stories of failure. You know, the Hindu gods, they're, you know, if I look at the European tradition, which I know better, you know, the children don't stay at home and do what mummy and daddy says and achieve the corporate KPIs or attend a family stand-up every day. Yeah, the stories aren't about that. They're fundamentally about children disobeying parents, meeting wicked witches, meeting wolves. Yeah, we make sure there's a happy ending because we want them to go to sleep at night. Um, but we don't actually, we, we use stories of failure because it teaches better than stories of success. Um, one of the ways we actually achieve cultural change in organizations these days is basically to agree what we don't want to be rather than agree what we do want to be, which is much easier to get results on. And also, if you can agree where you don't want to go, it leaves open more possibilities that you can explore. Uh, we also build worst practice databases for companies rather than best practice database, databases because people learn more from failure than success. And actually, if you go back to the Agile Manifesto, it's more about what shouldn't happen than what should happen. But it's been translated into a series of prescriptions. So realizing that failure and using failure for teaching and learning and knowledge is key, is vital. Um, that's actually out of sequence. Um, the third thing, um, bit of science, which I want to spend most of my time on is complexity science. This is from Brian Arthur. He says, complexity is about multiple interacting agents. Everything is open-ended. And the key thing to understand about a complex system is there's a perpetual novelty. So the picture here is a pile of fishing nets um, taken on a key yeah, in the Mediterranean. Now, if I pick that up, it will entangle. Um, if the fisherman picks it up, he knows the sequence of disposition so he can pick it up and still use the nets. But it's a type of entanglement. If you have naivety, you can't see how things are connected. They'll go, they'll go together in novel or unusual ways. And a metaphor for this, that's what comes of, not being able to see my slides. Yeah. Okay. So no sequence here. Sorry about that. So basically, a complex adaptive system is highly entangled. 
So everything is connected with everything else. And critically, linkages matter more than things. How things are connected is the most important aspect of any system. But because you've got so many things interacting with so many other things, it's not possible to create a linear relationship between cause and effect. Um, so all you can do is measure the probability that something will happen, called a disposition. And of course, it may or may not happen or the stable aspects of the system, which is called a propensity, the aspects of the system you can manage. Um, and this basically argues against endpoint definition. You can't define a goal. I'll come back to what I said earlier. You define a, you define a journey with a sense of direction. And I'll mention this now, and I'll happily go into more detail on questions. The big new change for this on software architecture is effectively to define a form of scaffolding and then define people and software as objects which can entangle around the scaffolding so that applications emerge as a result of the entanglement rather than being designed. And that's a major change in software design and architecture which is coming out of complexity theory. Now there are some implications of this. First of all, one of the problems with a complex adaptive system is retrospective coherence. So when I look backwards, everything makes perfect sense because I can join up the dots. But if I just go through the simple mathematics of this, if I have four dots, then there are six potential linkages that can form between the dots, which means overall there are 64 possible patterns. Now, if I go to 10 dots, and you know, if I'm with a group of audience, I can now ask people for their estimates, but I can't do it this time. If I go up to 10, people variously estimate, you know, 500, a million, something like that. It's actually over 3.6 trillion. And if I go up to 12 dots, then it goes up to 4.8 quadrillion or greater. Um, and if you think about the amount of dots there are in a human system, they're infinitely greater than that. So whereas with the benefit of hindsight, I can see how things join up. Hindsight doesn't lead to foresight. It's a very dangerous aspect. And you can see this in some of the sort of methods and tools. Secondly, as I said, dispositions are what count. The key thing to understand about a complex system is that there are no <clears throat> linear relationships between cause and effect. So there is no right answer. And critically, the same thing will not happen again the same way twice, except by accident. And as I said, this concept of interaction is key. Now, I'm not going to go into the Canavian framework in this talk, but one of the great values of Scrum as a method, and Scrum is a method, not a framework, as far as I'm concerned, or a series of methods, is it allows what in Canavian terms is called a liminal state between truly complex and highly complicated. And the great success of Scrum, which is a series of linear iterations against a defined need, is its ability to make things which are at the borderline of complexity complicated. Now, if you want to move into pure complexity, there are other techniques, and I'll give you two examples of ones that we developed. One of which, by the way, goes back to DSDM in the over 30 years ago. So one of the ones we're using now is called Trio. So that's where you take a young, bright programmer, um, somebody who's got a lot more age behind them, a lot more experience, who thinks of the system as a whole, so that's a systems architect or a tester. Testers are actually quite good at seeing the bigger implications. Together with a user trained to talk to IT people, and then it's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than the other way around. Um, and those three are asked to actually produce a prototype, some ideas for change. So instead of sending a systems analyst out to interview you people, you throw 20 or 30 trios at the problem for a couple of weeks and see what they come up with. And that's an example of a complex system technique. You're throwing multiple small parallel experiments. They're parallel, they're not in sequence. Yeah? And seeing what happens and then consolidating the material, which then, of course, becomes a feed into a technique like Scrum. The other one, and I originally developed this in DSDM days many years ago, DSDM was a precursor of Agile, is called Triple Eight, and that's where you run a joint application design workshop. So for example, the first one we ran was in Farnborough in the UK, where we get prototypers and architects working with users over an intensive one day period, and they produce a series of working prototypes or wireframes about what the system would be like. 
We then pass that on to a team in Mumbai without knowledge of the original user need and said, what can you do to improve it? And they had eight hours to do that before they handed it over to a team in San Jose in the Valley with the same instructions. And then it came back to the original JAD session the next day. And of course, it had gone through two rapid periods of mutation. And every time we run that, I've seen users sit down and say, God, we wouldn't have thought of that. Can we please have it? Now, that's an example of a biological approach, an ecosystems approach. You're deliberately increasing the mutation before you commit resources to development. So those are examples of some complex adaptive techniques that you can use, but they're based on that core theory. And finally on this is kind of like you start to use more heuristics than rules. US Marines have a basic set of heuristics. If the battlefield plan breaks down, then you follow the high, you capture the high ground, stay in touch, keep moving. So developing heuristics, which give you a set of what are called enabling constraints for conditions of uncertainty is key. And there are three overall principles to complex systems design. And I'm gonna mention these and I can go into more detail if later if you want. The first one, is you need to optimize the granularity of what you're dealing with. So if you're dealing with organizational units and it's complex, you want lots of small teams, smaller than five, smaller than 15, smaller than 150 to reference the Dunbar sequence, although that's often misinterpreted in our job. So smaller teams can combine and recombine in different ways. Communication needs to be at the level of tweets or Facebook posts because people can absorb multiple fragmented data, they can't adopt, adopt structured data. If you're in a crisis, you move from high level objectives to a series of mission statements or mission goals, yeah, with command, commander's intent incorporated. So the more complex the situation is, the smaller the things you need to deal with. And if you think about it, you know, DNA is four chemical compounds, from which the huge sophistication of organic life arises. So firstly, you optimize the granularity. Second, you distribute and diversify cognition. Remember the 17% in the gorilla? We don't, when we're doing situational assessment, we'll bring in a network of people who are culturally, experientially, cognitively diverse, get them to assess the situation, all working independently of each other. This is a wisdom of crowds approach so that we can identify dominant groups and minority groups so we can find the 17%. You can't afford to centralize cognitive processes. And finally, you need to disintermediate the decision makers. So it's more valuable for a, program, for a scrum team, for example, to look at a collection of anecdotes from users about their day-to-day -day frustrations than it is to look at that being summarized into some sort of user story. Um, in fact, I'd argue particularly things like epics are actually quite dangerous in, in a complex world. So disintermediation is you want direct access to the raw data without any interpretive material. And I'd hold those because those are fundamental to complex systems design. And then the final point on this, and sorry, it's not that clear on the screen because I haven't faded the background picture. You don't scale a complex adaptive system by aggregation or imitation. You scale it by decomposition and recombination. That's why I and others have condemned SAFE a priori, because it seeks to scale by aggregation, where you can't scale a complex system in that way. You've got to break it into smaller parts and allow them to recombine. So one of the uses for Kevin, for example, is as a multi-tool approach, so you define tools and methods to different Kinevin domains, particularly the liminal domains. You define how they would interact with each other, and then you've got a scalable system. You don't put all of those methods into a massive engineering diagram and issue certificates. You allow things to combine in novel or different ways. Which leads me on to something I've mentioned once already, which is the key concept of scaffolding. Now, we spent the last three years looking at a complexity-based approach to design thinking. And that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, the famous double diamond is a very linear process, largely based on expert investigation or ethnography and expert ideas generation or ideation. Um, second reason is design thinking, like Agile, has become a commodity. Two-day courses, certifications, all that sort of stuff. 
the reality is, I mean, my cousin's son is an architectural professor now, but he did five years of training at Cambridge University, an apprenticeship in an architect's firm, a doctorate at Harvard University over the next three years, and another five years apprentice. Only then he can call himself an architect. So the trivialization of design was another motivation here. So several things came out of that. One is um, another key agile technique, by the way, which is mapping unarticulated needs. Also distributed ideation and ra radical repurposing. But the thing I want to focus on now, because it's key to the next generation of software development, is the idea of scaffolding. Now there's a whole typology of scaffolding, but I'll give you a couple of basic distinctions. Scaffolding can be resilient or it can be robust. If resilient, it doesn't change. It, it can survive massive pressure until it finally breaks and then the break is catastrophic. Resilient scaffolding can flex and change, so it's constantly changing, but overall it maintains some sort of coherence. And of course that uses more energy, so it's a trade-off. Scaffolding can be internal or external. So think of an exoskeleton of an insect. It means there's very little variety. It provides high structure, but it's a limit to growth. Whereas the endoskeleton of a mammal allows for a huge amount of variety, though overall the shape is coherent, but it allows for high growth. And there are other distinctions than that. For example, dark scaffolding, um, elastic, and so on. So we've done a lot of work on this, but the basic principle is, dependent on the degree of uncertainty in your environment, you don't start off with where you think you want to be. You start off by laying down a basic scaffolding. At higher levels of uncertainty, it can be very structured. At lower levels of certainty, it has higher ambiguity. And you define interactions around that. Now, I put that down as a marker because that's a lecture in its own right. The second thing I want to talk about is, in this respect is what's called lead indicators or attitudinal measures. So one of the big things we do in, in our work in, in complexity is to measure attitudes to things like safety, attitudes to things like culture, because we can measure those in their dispositional states, whereas compliance is effectively a lag indicator. Had a huge amount of success on this in the safety industry, because if you can change attitudes, you make the likelihood of, of injury more difficult. But it's also of critical importance, we're now doing work here in cybersecurity, where we're measuring attitudes to cybersecurity, because changing that is a lot easier than dealing with compliance breaches. And then of course it comes into culture. So that's an example of what's called dispositional mapping. And then the third bit of this little section of the talk before I conclude, um, this is again a complexity concept. This is um, a reference to Alicia Giraro's famous metaphor that a complex adaptive system is like bramble bushes in a thicket. It's the entanglement concept. But this is from an article by myself and Kurtz where we picked up on that. And we went back into the origin of the word managed in English. And its origins are actually in the, the Italian word managere which I can't pronounce properly and I've got to learn, which was effectively the ability to ride, to handle and train a horse. And with that, you've got the concept of co-evolution. You can't direct the horse, you have to train it, you have to learn to ride with it. It and you have to learn each other's idiosyncrasies. But then that word gets corrupted by the French. Uh, many things have been corrupted by the French, not as many as by the English, but many, into household management which is how people now currently see it. And I think one of the things a lot of us are arguing is we need both concepts. So for ordered systems, you can manage them in the French sense of the word, but in complex systems, you're riding horses with constant flow and constant change. So that actually implies much more the sort of metaphor of management as handling and training horses. And to me, that's a much more important distinction between leadership and management and so on. So that's an important metaphor and it's not reflected at the moment in agile training, which is more about tick, tick box type entry type structures. So to finish off on this, culture is the other thing people blame on mindset. I've never liked the word mindset because human minds are never set. It's, it's the wrong metaphor. Um, but culture is critical and culture varies significantly. 
So what I thought I'd do, I'd show you an example of a dispositional map. So this is where we've actually gone out and presented a series of statements about the organization. And we've got everybody in the organization to tell stories about what they think it means for that and to interpret their own stories. And from that, we've mapped a set of dispositional states. Now, if you look at this, you can see the blue bit at the bottom, it has no overlap with the purple bit at the top. So you've got, you know, they've all been given the same data, they've all been given the same way to interpret it. Those two groups of people see the world so differently that they'll only be in conflict if they talk. Whereas the green area in the middle overlaps both and integrates some of the others. That reddish area to the towards the right is an outlier group. It's a small group of people with a different culture who are seeing things differently. Now these type of maps are critical. They can be put together literally in five minutes if you build your human sensor networks properly. And they allow you to identify minority groups, majority groups, but they also allow you to see where your culture is and how you could change it. And so for example, if you want to have the green bit as your culture, and that's defined by stories, then you click on the bottom bit of the blue and say, what can we do tomorrow to create fewer stories like these? And then click on the top bit and more stories like those. And that more like this, fewer like that is called a vector theory of change. So you change a complex, the dispositional state of a complex adaptive system by nudging the system to spaces where it's already predisposed to go rather than trying to engineer it top down. And that comes back to my start journeys, don't try and achieve goals. And so the final slide on this, I started off with dogs, so I'll finish up with cats. Uh, this is from Kipling's Just So Stories. So Kipling has some good and bad imperial aspects to him, but the Just So Stories are wonderful. And in this, which is the first story in the book, man tames the horse and the cow and the dog. And whereas the cat wants the benefits of living in the cave with the fire and the milk, it doesn't want the obligations. So it tricks humans, yeah, by amusing the baby, by solving problems, so that they give it food and they give it drink. And there's this lovely phrase, yeah, I and mean, I'll say it intact, he will kill mice and he will be kind to babies when in house. But when he has done that in between times, when the moon gets up and the night comes, he is the cat that walks by himself and all places are alike to him. And then he goes out to the wet wild woods or up to the wet wild trees or onto the wet wild roofs, waving his wild tail and walking by his wild loan. Now, we need to think, as I said, riding horses against household management, domestication of dogs against cats. And as a final controversial statement, I think people who are owned by cats understand complexity people who try and train dogs are less likely to do so. Okay, I cram quite a lot into that. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions or go through anything. Uh, and I've left 15 minutes for that. Yeah. So over to you guys. Thank you, Dave. That was a wonderful talk, especially there are a lot of insights around what's how an organization should approach a complex system. Um, I have a couple of questions that I can get started with. So one of the questions from one of the participants, uh, can we do scaffolding on both the resilient and elastic? If yes, what are the practices or structures needed to achieve that? And, and we, we generally class elastic constraints or elastic scaffolding as um, robust, not resilient because if they break, the break is catastrophic. Right? So I think, I think that's a fundamental thing is you create this thing and you can give it flexibility, but if it breaks and it's catastrophic, then that, that's a different class, it's not resilient. Yeah? Um, I often talk about, for example, a salt marsh as against a seawall, as another illustration. Yeah? So the answer is probably no, not. Yeah? Um, and there are some interesting metaphors. So, for example, there's a nutrient lattice that people put over burns. So it provides a structure for the skin to regrow, but the nutrient dissolves into the skin. Right? Now, actually, a lot of software design should be designed like that. Yeah, um, and allow those structures to reform. 
Yeah, that's an interesting insight. So um, personally, from your answer, I got one more question around. So you talk about constraints in your in your Kinefin foundations, right? There are different constraints, robust, resilient, elastic. So um, to be very short, do you think an organization that is trying to be really agile should find those constraints first, then try to approach them? Yeah, we basically say constraint mapping is fundamental. Yeah, the, the first thing you do is map the constraints and identify which ones you can change. I mean, this is kind of like a three-part question. What can I change? Out of the things that I can change, where can I monitor the impact of that change? And out of the things where I can monitor the impact, where can I amplify success or dampen failure? So those are three fundamental questions, yeah? So if you map the constraints, you ask that question, and then you do the things and see what happens. Yeah? And that's actually lower energy costs than trying to design a system. Great, thank you very much. And that's an interesting uh, insight there. There is another question that I could say, we have been teaching people agile is a mindset and you spotted a wonderful thought process. You said agile is not a mindset. No. So there's a question that how do you define agility? Uh, I think the word agile is now so misused, it's probably may not be rescuable, yeah? Um, I, it's ironic, it's called Agile when it's a series of highly structured methods and tools which don't allow for deviation. Um, and you get people, I mean, I, Steve Denning has just written a book where he's tried to fit every company as successful into his definition of Agile. Like he previously wrote a book where he tried to fit every company that was then successful into his, de his definition of radical leadership, right? Uh, something is agile if it said it was going to be agile and it got results. It's not about retrospective coherence. Yeah? So I think the issue is that you want to be agile when you need to be and not when you don't. So there's nothing wrong with waterfall. If you're doing high level IT infrastructure projects, waterfall works. And I still remember sitting down with Telstra software engineers in Brisbane once and they said, well, we don't get promoted unless we're agile but all our projects are waterfall. So we're running one year sprints so we can say we're agile. And that was absurd, but you've got to admire them. Yeah. In, in terms of the way they were working. Right? So from my point of view, there's nothing wrong with waterfall. There's nothing wrong with time box techniques, which agile is completely forgotten and they have huge value. There's nothing wrong with scrum. There's nothing wrong with trios. There's nothing wrong with that. All of these methods and they're all methods. Yeah. None of them is a framework all work within different types of cause and effect system. And you have to be able to assemble them together in different combinations rather than adopting one in all. In, there are no universals in methods. There are only contextual applications. Thank you, Dave. So there is another comment um, from a participant. It was a wonderful session, very good insight. One question around can really be, can we scale agility? What do you think about scaling agility? Is it a myth or a fact? You can scale practice by decomposition and recombination, but you don't scale it by doing more of the same. So I say, I think, you know, my, I get attacked every now and then by the safe clones, all right? You sort of come out en masse if you attack them. But I've yet to find, and I now, now know about ooh, 20 examples of where safe has been abandoned, but people won't say it because of the amount of money they send from it. But in practice, good people did the right things despite the method, not because of the method. Right? And that's ever so common. Right? So I think the key thing on scaling is get to an optimal level of method and data design. Then you scaffold them to define the interactions. And as things stabilize, then you scale them. But you don't start off you know, with a massive scaling process. It just won't work. It's a priori wrong. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And the definition of complexity hasn't changed because it comes from natural science, but the balance of systems has. So, I mean, as soon as this call is over, I'm in lockdown for the next five hours to finish off a handbook that I'm writing for the European Union Policy Lab on how to manage in COVID in a crisis and complexity. So there are standard techniques for exiting what used to be called disorder in Kinevin is now called apparatic. So there are standard techniques and methods to handle complexity and handle chaos. The point about a crisis like COVID is everything is in those domains and nothing is in the other domains. So it requires a different focus, but it doesn't change the definition. 
Yeah, I think Venkat, uh, that question is answered. I have a private question to me. Uh, we have been hearing about systemic thinking and we have also got impressed by the complexity thinking. What's your take on the systemic thinking? Um, I think systems thinking and complexity thinking are different but compatible. Um, so there's actually, I can, I can send you, there's a whole picture being produced by a university professor which shows the origins of the theories, which has me at the end of one chain as applied complexity, so I quite like it, right? But it basically says complexity sciences come out of natural sciences, whereas system science came out of information theory. So they have different origins, yeah? And so information theory, like anything from the social sciences, is an explanatory construct, yeah, which is only as good as its last retrospective set of data. Whereas something based on the natural sciences has predictive capability, but it's based on repeatable experiments. So for me, the dominant approach on systems thinking, which mostly comes from cybernetics, mm. assumes basically causality, even if it's multi-level and multi multi-feedback loops, whereas complexity deals with systems which have no causality. And to my mind, that difference is so important that you can't lump them under the same label, though some people do. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't have any new question, but yeah, I got a question now. Um... So uh, one curious question from my end, uh, Dave, because I, I got really, very good insight. Um, so what do you think is the, is the future of uh, agility? So um, we, we heard about a lot of things and especially on the complexity thinking, but I just very curious to understand your thoughts around the future of agility. Uh, you, can, you can look at previous movements. You look at DSDM, which soared and then fell, and that's what we're seeing with Agile. So as long as something claims to be universal, it will have a limited lifespan before it hits the barriers of its, of its contextual, real contextual application. So I think we'll take a lot of stuff from Agile, but we'll move on. And I think that's one of the things people now have to start to look at. This is called apex predator theory, because one of the sure and certain signs that something is about to break and change is when it becomes commodified. So think about IBM, I'll give you my favorite example. IBM dominates hardware. Then hardware becomes a commodity, but IBM doesn't notice until it's too late and then Microsoft takes over. And then software becomes a commodity, but Microsoft doesn't wait to see that till it's too late, so Apple takes over. And this sort of cycle of dominance commodification is universal, yeah? I, I say that advisedly. So once something reaches the commodification, they start to work on its successor. Yeah. Thank you very much. I don't see any new questions. Um, let me check one second. Yep. I don't see any new questions. Um, we would like to thank you very much for your time, Dave. Uh, we nice. extend our gratitude. Thank you very much for spending time with us. We look forward to seeing you or talking to you in one of the other webinars. In better times. Yeah. Yep. Yes, guys. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for Thank your time. You,